I'm Art Bell, the guy who's usually on in the morning, so it's hard to uh, uh, get rid of that habit. And in some cases, in fact, Dreamland does air in the morning, as it is repeated across this nation. It's good to be here. Uh, as the opening told you, we discuss things that are not quite so easily put in a box every week, and that will be the case this week as well. It should be intriguing. Don't you want to know about the origins of the human race? Well, I do and have for a long time, and we've got a man with another theory this evening, Michael Cremo, and he'll be coming to us all the way from uh, Florida. First, however, as we do every week, coming to us from Philadelphia once again, uh, it is Linda Howe, home once again in Philadelphia. Linda, good evening. Hi, Art. Hi. How's everything? Well, it's been uh, spring today, and I think uh, there's some hope of getting out of all this water and winter that everybody's been coping with, and that's a good step. Well, everybody in California has the same wish with regard to water. That's right. And remember back in September, I announced that my book, Glimpses of Other Realities, was going to be carried by Barnes & Noble? Yes. Well, dozens of our Dreamland listeners called in frustration to tell me the book wasn't in the Barnes & Noble system then, as I was told it would be. Recently, however, I had the pleasure of walking into a large Barnes & Noble bookstore in Philadelphia and discovering copies of glimpses displayed on a shelf. So the book is finally and officially in the Barnes & Noble stores and system. And to our Dreamland listeners, if you can't find a shelf copy, all you have to do is order through the computer system. My goal in doing the books and documentaries has been to share with as large a general audience as possible the difficult and complex information about non-human interaction on our planet. So I'm grateful for this larger bookstore connection and hope all our listeners will encourage Barnes & Noble to keep carrying books like glimpses as we try to deal with these difficult subjects. Hey, Linda, I'm curious. How does it feel to go to a big bookstore and uh, see your own books sitting there? Well, it was so... Uh... <laughs> To use the phrase, it made my heart sing because I don't think anybody could possibly know how difficult the last 15 years of my life have been because I have chosen to explore these subjects. I'm certain that's true. But, I mean, to, to see your own work uh, there in a major bookstore must have been a serious thrill. It was. <laughs> it is, and I hope our listeners will continue to call on Barnes & Noble and their other uh, bookstores because the more that people ask for books like Glimpses of Other Realities and Alien Harvest, the more we'll be able to sustain keeping those books in these bookstores. Sure. Now, this week I was also a guest on the NBC weekly television show, The Other Side, which uh, in this case was a show about investigators of the paranormal. Uh -huh. That program on the other side is broadcast after the morning news show on NBC and is focusing on some of the same subjects that we cover in Dreamland. So I encourage our radio listeners to look for the other side in their TV guide. Um, they when... asked me to come back, and when I know that next date, I'll let everybody know. All right, so it's, are you saying it's already aired? Yeah, it aired this oh. past week, and I did not know precisely the date when we were on last Sunday, and it turned up that it was on that Wednesday. Wednesday, and I've gotten uh, so many calls, and apparently they're going to uh, try to do another show, and I'll for sure find out and let you guys know. Oh, please. All right. Now, this past week, I also received a call from a retired police officer named Bill Hill, who worked for 25 years in the Peoria, Illinois Police Department, and then retired to Salmon, Idaho, a very remote wilderness area of northern Idaho. Mr. Hill owned some horses and had bought a new buckskin on January 12th. Two weeks later, on January 26th, he was shocked to find the horse dead and mutilated. He was very frustrated. He did not know that there were people like myself and Dr. Atchula and others investigating cases like this, and he finally contacted me this week because he, the law enforcement there, and the veterinarian who examined the horse are completely baffled. This is Mr. Hill's eyewitness account. When I saw the horse laying there, I saw a large wound in the side of his neck with uh, blood on it, and uh, the blood was still steaming, and the snow was still melting on the horse, so 
Luckily, it was fairly warm. So I told her not to go near it, and I backtracked. I didn't go within 10, 15 feet of the horse. Could you see any tracks on that moist ground? Absolutely none. It was a fresh snow. And uh, the other horses hadn't been down in that lower pasture. And there were no tracks down there. And uh, there was no tracks when I walked up to it. So we went back to the phone, called the uh, sheriff's department, and a deputy come out. And when he came out, we got our flashlights. And we walked a little closer. And uh, at that time, I also observed there was a large patch of skin off the belly towards the uh, the rear end. And uh, it was probably a foot to a foot and a half in diameter, and it went around behind the base of the penis, and there wasn't any skin on his penis either. So it was as if the hide had been removed, hide deep down to the surface of the muscle, and that the surface height of the penis was removed also. Right. It was just the, the stomach hadn't been penetrated. It hadn't gone into the stomach cavity or anything. It just took the, the outside layer of uh, skin off there. So my first impression when I saw the uh, the hole was that somebody shot it from the highway. And uh, he's a buckskin horse and an elk colored. And during hunting season, we have a lot of accidents where cattle and horses are, are shot, or sometimes it's just vandalism. So when I saw the damage done to the horse, I thought it was strange that whoever, if somebody had shot it from a distance, that they would come up this close to our house and uh, do what they did to the horse. Uh, this is only about 300 feet from my house. It's out in plain sight, out in the pasture, and it's right across, uh, my neighbor right across the, the uh, road from me is approximately the same distance. Uh, we live on a dead-end road, and the road ends about 300 feet up before where the horse was. So if anybody had been out there an hour before you arrived, which was broad daylight since the horse was still steaming, uh, you would think that it would have been obvious for someone to be in that uh, pasture uh, with that horse. They would have had to walk several hundred feet in in the open to walk up to this area. And uh, if anybody would have been in our house or at the neighbor's home would have seen it, why, they, it would have been obvious. And they obviously spent some time down there skinning it and uh, to take the skin off of it to, for the job that they did. Uh, so we walked, made a big circle around the area where the horse was. We walked into the neighbor's pasture between the highway in our place, with the highway's about five, six hundred feet away, and uh, we made a big, big loop all the way around, and we walked down into a pasture behind us, and we found no tracks at all, no evidence where anybody had been on the property at all. It, it probably had been snowing uh, maybe an hour, or two hours. There was a couple inches of snow on the ground. It was a wet snow, and uh, for the way that the blood was steaming coming out of the hole in the neck. It, it appeared very warm, and the snow was still melting on the horse. When I looked at it, I, I didn't really realize it until I went up to the sheriff's office and got the pictures of it today. There was snow underneath the horse, and there was snow in a place, in places where it couldn't, the horse couldn't have been laying there, and it snowed, snowed over him. There had to have been snow on the ground where the horse was, was laid down. It uh, was pretty obvious to us that he died right where he, uh, right where he dropped. Hmm. But the only uh, wound that we could see was a hole in the neck. And this removal of the hide. Plus the, the removal of the hide. And so my first thought was that uh, it had been shot in the neck. And uh, the head was taken to a veterinarian here. And uh, they cut it off to examine it. And they x-rayed it. And they could find no uh, bullet fragments or wadding from a shotgun shell or anything inside it. And the veterinarian that... Uh, Autopsy that said that uh, she'd never seen anything like it. It definitely wasn't a gunshot wound. It only went into the uh, neck about two to three inches. And uh, the x-ray didn't show any lead fragments or anything where a bullet would have done any damage or broken up inside the neck. And Mr. Hill also learned that the Salmon Idaho Sheriff's Department received a report about a UFO in the area around the time of the horse's death in oh. January. Oh, I was going to ask about that, and there it is, the connection. Yep. yep. Uh, and I think that uh, you can't stress enough the bizarre high strangeness of a horse found lying on two inches of snow mm -hmm. with this kind of a hole in the neck 
with the hide uh, in a very clean cut, only hide deep across the belly and uh, taking the skin, even of the scrotum and the penis, very thinly without any sign of any tracks anywhere in the entire pasture or around that horse and with no signs of any fluid or any blood on the snow. Give me a guess. What do I think happened? Yep. Well, I think it fits into these other eyewitness reports uh, that I have uh, brought to Dreamland this past year from people like uh, Mr. McKnight in Oregon who encountered the mutilated animal out in Sand Springs and uh, found a rancher there who was living in a trailer who described for him how he had seen uh, glowing, white glowing spheres in the sky come over the pasture, send down beams of light, had watched animals from the pasture rise in those beams of light, and then when they were returned, they were either returned down the beam of light or were simply dropped from some kind of an object in the sky. And when they dropped, they were there dead with these excisions. Now that could explain what happened to this horse in Idaho. And that well, is what could explain these other cases where cows have been found on wet sandbars mm -hmm. with no tracks around them either. How about why? Well, then we get into what I have been trying to investigate for the last decade or so, the motive, the intent behind some non-human intelligence interacting with the plant, animal, and human life on our planet. And as Bud Hopkins keeps walking into the same uh, seeming motive in the human abduction syndrome, uh, genetic harvesting, that is one area that the abductees themselves have said that in the few cases that have involved both abductions and animal mutilations, that they understand that there is a harvesting of genetic material by something off-planet uh, to create some sort of hybrid species that is part life on our planet and part something else out there, and that still does not answer the bigger question, why? Which it is doesn't... what we're all trying to find out. At, at least it helps, I guess. Uh, all right, Linda, a lot of people want to contact you uh, for various reasons, including your books, your publications, to write you letters, um, to fax you. So why don't you give us your fax number and your address? Thanks, Art. I really, really do uh, value the communication I'm getting from the Dreamland uh, listeners. And I am Linda Howe at Post Office Box 538 in Huntingdon Valley, Pennsylvania. That's an English spelling, H-U-N-T-I-N-G, D as in dog, O-N, Huntingdon Valley, P-A, zip code 19006. And my fax number is area code 215-491-9888. That is definitely the fax number. And again, post office box 538, Huntington Valley, Pennsylvania, 19006. Excellent. All right. Um, I'm sure you'll get uh, a number of communications from all of this. Once again, fascinating. Thank you, Linda. Next week, Philadelphia? Yeah, I am going to be in Philadelphia this month uh, before or till the end of the month, and then I'm going to be going to Tennessee, and I'll be doing reports from there, but I'll let you know. Excellent. So I will be here next Sunday, and uh, I agree with you that the forbidden history of man, which is what I think we're dealing with, is going to be one of the continually emerging subjects over the next few, few years. My guess as well. Great. Thank you, Linda. Thank you, Art. Take care. Linda Howe. Actually, it is the hidden history of the human race, but my guess is by the time we're done, we'll find out it is forbidden as well, as in forbidden knowledge. Michael Cremo, or is it Cremo? We'll find out in just a second. Has written a book called The Hidden History of the Human Race. And uh, basically, I think he is going to suggest that our history as a human species is not as the scientist would have us believe. Perhaps not even close. He is a research associate with Bhaktivedanta, which is an institute that specializes in the history and philosophy of science. 
His persistent investigation during the eight years of writing his widely acclaimed Forbidden Archaeology has documented a major scientific cover-up. He's currently researching the companion volume to Forbidden Archaeology entitled The Descent of Man Revisited. It is a startling new explanation of human origins. So let's go, I believe, all the way to Florida and uh, and say hello, Michael. I'm going to be uh, I'm going to be cautious here and just say, Michael. How do we pronounce your last name properly, Michael? Cremo. Cremo. That's right. So I had it right the first time. Uh, very good, um, Michael. It's a very provocative title, The Hidden History of the Human Race. How wrong do we have it about our origins? Well, if you listen to the current scientific establishment, they will tell you that human beings like you and I have only been on this planet for about 100,000 years. Right. And before that, you would have had more ape-like ancestors. But what I did was look into the entire history of archaeology and anthropology, look at every discovery that's ever been made over the past 150 years, and what emerged from that study is that there is a huge mountain of evidence suggesting that human beings like ourselves have been on this planet literally for hundreds of millions of years. Uh, but this evidence has been suppressed, it's been forgotten, it's been ignored, and I think the people of this country need to know about it. Oh, uh, where, where do we start? Um, I, then you're saying that uh, those who believe in evolution, scientific evolution as it has been laid out for us, those who believe in creation the way it's been laid out for us, both are wrong? Uh, that's, that's right. Um, in other words, I'll give you some examples All right. how this process of uh, what we would call knowledge filtration has been going on for about 150 years. Now, I can give you examples going all the way back to the 19th century, all the way up to the present. Let's, let's start with the present. In 1979, Mary Leakey, who is one of the most famous archaeologists of this century, Indeed. Uh, she discovered in Africa in a country called Tanzania, some human footprints. And every expert who has looked at these prints has said they are no different than the footprints that you or I might make if we were walking on a beach today. The unusual thing about these prints, however, is that they were found in rock that is 3.6 million years old. Now, I, you know, I just told you the standard scientific doctrine is that uh, human beings capable of making such prints have only been around for about 100,000 years. Yes. Somebody might say, well, maybe the ape men who lived at that time could have made those prints somehow. No, because of uh, the, the fossil, fossil foot bones from those ancient ape men are in the museums. They do not fit those prints because they had very long, curved toes. How do we know that the prints were made as long as you're saying, uh, the, the, as long ago as you're saying they were? Uh, th this is the information that is given to us by a uh, geologist. Now, you could always say, well, perhaps those dates are wrong, but what Richard Thompson, my co-author, and I did as part of our methodology was uh, except for the sake of argument, the dates that scientists give. To All right, well, okay, that makes sense. Michael, we're right. at the bottom of the hour here, and we've got to pause. We've got a lot to do and a long way to go, so stay right where you are, and we'll be back to you in about four minutes. All right. Michael Cremo is my guest. The Hidden History of the Human Race is book, and we will probe. Kingdom of Nine. You're hearing Dreamland with Art Bell. To participate in the program, call toll-free 1-800-618-8255. 1-800-618-8255. First-time callers, area code 702-727-1222. Or the wildcard line at 702-727-1295. This is the CBC Radio Network. It absolutely is. Good evening and Dreamland underway. Welcome. The Hidden History of the Human 
race, the entire human race. Michael Cremo, you're back on. Hi. Hi, Art. Okay, uh, Michael, it seems to me that if the history is not what the creationists say, and if the history is not what um, what uh, evolutionists say, scientists, then it seems to me there's a whole group of people out there, experts of all kinds, who would like to take you and grind you into little pieces. Am I about right? Oh, I mean, this book, The Hidden History of the Human Race, has been causing shock waves in the scientific community. We mm. have Richard Leakey, for example. You know Richard Leakey. Indeed. He says, he says your book is pure humbug. It does not deserve to be taken uh, seriously by anyone but a fool. That's exactly uh, the reaction I expected. I mean, this, I mean that's exactly what you would expect uh, from uh, one of the architects of this whole paradigm. Uh, but on the other hand, we do have some more independent researchers who are really cheering us on. Um, Virginia Steen McIntyre, a geologist who had the misfortune to discover some of these unusual things, says uh, this, this book is a, a real eye-opener, and that she, even she herself didn't realize how much evidence there really is out there. So... Uh, we're getting, as I said, uh, a lot of uh, positive reaction and a lot of negative reaction, and I think that's what you have to expect from a book like this, The Hidden History of the Human Race. All right. Um, I've got a little sheet from you, and it suggests some myths that we suffer with, um, with traditional views, one of them being that we evolved from apes. That is indeed the traditional view, is it not? Ape became man? Yes, it is. If you go to any natural history museum, I mean, you'll see those little displays, the little ape-like creature, and then right. a slightly bigger ape man, and then a the right. bigger one, and a bigger one, and finally a human being uh, right. right towards the end at about 100,000 years. That's right. That's you'll what I've always seen. In the textbooks, uh, you, you look on uh, the television specials, Walter Cronkite, Carl Sagan, they'll all be saying that. They'll all be repeating uh, the standard dogma. But the actual facts that oh. scientists have uncovered over the past 150 years simply don't support that. All right, well, let's say Michael Cremo were to set up a demonstration, a little demonstration of uh, uh, the same exact thing, except following what you believe to be the case, uh, during that whole span with all those little beings slowly becoming man, what would Michael Cremo's uh, display look like? Well, we would have uh, humans like us, coexisting with these other creatures just like today you have human beings you have apes you have monkeys and this will get us into a very interesting subject but if you take very seriously the reports of the Sasquatch, the Bigfoot uh, the uh, Yeti yes. uh, it would appear that even today we are coexisting with some of these ape man like creatures. Now, we don't say there were no ape men. All right, now, uh, does that mean Sasquatch, in your view, is the caveman uh, could, simply reduced in numbers but still barely here? Could be a survival of the Neanderthals or the Homo erectus type creatures. Now, mm -hmm. now I will say that in, in many cases these uh, creatures do seem to have some. Uh, powers that ordinary animals don't, and uh, this will get us into a whole other subject. But physically, physically, the descriptions of these creatures appear to match uh, the ape man like creatures we heard about from science. And, and I'll also say now, uh, you were mentioning I'm I'm uh, with the Bhakti Vedanta Institute, yes. which, which is the science studies branch of the International Society for Krishna Consciousness, and we get a lot of our inspiration from ancient writings of different civilizations, for example, India. Uh, and in some of those ancient writings, uh, you do find descriptions of human civilizations going back hundreds of millions of years on this planet. You also find descriptions of very primitive ape man-like creatures who use stone tools. Mm -hmm. And when you look at the evidence, it really appears that we have coexisted with these creatures and with apes and monkeys for as long as as far back as you would care to trace. Would it be your theory that we all arrived on the planet uh, in whatever manner our arrival together? Uh, 
uh, yes, that is what the facts actually suggest. And how we got here, that's a subject we intend to go into quite deeply in our next book, which we call Human Devolution. Devolution. Mm -hmm. Um... In, in what manner do you suggest we got here if we all arrived at the same time many... how long ago? Well, here's an interesting fact. The oldest artifact that we record in our book is 2.8 billion years old. Billion with a B? I'm sorry, billion with a B? Billion with a B. This is a grooved metallic sphere that was found in South Africa by miners. They're, they're, they're mining uh, near a town called Otosdalen in South Africa, a mineral called pyrophyllite. And when the miners go into the, these deposits, they're finding uh, perfectly round metal spheres. And this metal is very hard. It's so hard that you can't even scratch it with a steel point, huh. which means it's about as hard as diamonds. And some of these, one of these spheres in particular had three parallel grooves going around its equator, and no one has come up with a, a natural explanation for how these things could have been formed. Now, a lot of them are kept in a natural history museum in a little town called Klerksdorp in uh, South Africa, and the uh, Rolf Marx, who is the curator there, sent us some photographs of these objects, which you can see some in our book. But uh, the, the, the uh, uh, mineral deposits in which these things are found, in which the miners found them, are over 2 billion years old. Now, so that's taking us uh, back quite far. Sure is. According to your standard accounts, you wouldn't have it. Uh, you, you would just have some uh, maybe one-celled creatures living in the ocean at that time. Mm -hmm. uh, so we think, and, and this is something that uh, the standard scientists recognize. For example, William Howells, who's again one of the big anthropologists of this century, one of the architects of the current paradigm, uh, when he read The hi hi Hidden History of the Human Race, he said, well, uh, Michael, what you've done here is you've called into question not only our whole picture of human origins, but our whole picture of how life uh, could have arisen on this planet. It, what you're suggesting is that no evolutionary idea that you could possibly think of could work. And that's, and that's a fact. So uh, where we're headed is towards some kind of extraterrestrial. Oh, uh, well, I was going to get to that. Mm -hmm. uh, well, w are you believing then that some sort of extraterrestrial source uh, is responsible for our creation, our placement here, uh, and uh, is still to this day watching over us? Is that? Well, I'll, I'll tell I'll tell you what what we're um, uh, looking at. Right at the present moment, you've got three main theories of human origin. You've got number one, the Darwinian idea that we evolved from some simple one-celled creature. Yes. yes. You could call that descent with modification, <laughs> uh, but starting with the simple things, uh, and then gradually all the other plants and animals, and finally the human beings come. Yes. And then you have uh, the the standard creationist idea, which is that God pops it all into being somehow right in the beginning. Right. Then you have what I would call the extraterrestrial hypothesis, which mm -hmm. uh, places us as members of a kind of cosmic hierarchy, and there are contacts between uh, different planets and uh, solar systems. Yes. Now, from what we can see, from my co-author and I, Richard Thompson, and, and drawing on some of our sources in these ancient Sanskrit writings, uh, we're going to be taking elements from all three of those ideas and making a new synthesis. Uh, we think there's something, and Darwin had a little bit right, that there's some kind of descent with modification, but from what we can see, the descent is from higher beings, not on this planet, in other words, not starting out with a one-celled creature, but starting out with some very powerful human-like creatures, uh, in this cosmic hierarchy. Hmm. And uh, there is some 
kind of process of descent with modification going on. Now, from from that creationist account, which is the second main explanation, we would put a some kind of uh, god or a supreme intelligence and designer at the top of the whole system, but he's not popping everything into existence at once. He's using a process uh, of, which may involve uh, extraterrestrial contacts as part of it, and the whole thing has been going on for hundreds of millions of years, so that if, if we want to untangle our history, we may have to be dealing with all three of these. Isn't, isn't there some danger, though, in drawing from each one of the uh, separate hypotheses uh, that you will almost surely then get some part of it wrong? Well, uh, we want to look at what the evidence actually suggests. Um, and, of course, that's, we could discuss that, but uh, well, yeah, there, okay. there is mean... evidence for extraterrestrial contacts. There is evidence for some kind of a supreme uh, designing intelligence. Okay, Michael. Michael, let us say let us say that it is so um, that our beginnings were extraterrestrial in origin, right. and that there is some part of uh, evolution that's in play as well. In other, in other words, they started this, but we are evolving or devolving, depending on how you look at it, uh, and that's some sort of natural process. I'm not quite clear on the creator part of it. Um, in other words, you feel there was some sort of uh, creator even beyond our extraterrestrial yeah, in a, parentage. In a, higher, in a higher spiritual dimension of hmm. uh, starting the whole thing off. Right. Uh, and, there, and this uh, uh, supreme intelligent being would be uh, the source of, a, of what we would call a cosmic hierarchy of beings, which if you look at what people have thought and taught down through history, they pretty much have uh, this hierarchy where you have human beings on the terrestrial level, mm -hmm. uh, more powerful types of beings on a middle level, a, a, a celestial level, you might call it. Uh, if you go back to the time of the uh, Egyptians, for example, they had their gods, uh, the Romans, the Greeks, uh, the Australian Aboriginals, the American Indians, they all had this uh, uh, hierarchy of uh, human beings and then beings a little bit higher on the hierarchy with greater powers. Yes. What evidence is there for that? I think we get in where that evidence comes from, uh, the physical evidence uh, that we can see is the sort of thing that Linda Howe was talking about. Uh, I, that's exactly where I was going. A little bit earlier. This is showing uh, a physical evidence for creatures a little bit higher up. Okay, is that, in, in your opinion, evidence then that those who created us of extraterrestrial origin continue to monitor not just us, but the animals and all of their creations here on Earth? Uh, yes, this um, uh, process of... Um, uh, descent with modification uh, as far as we can see it, in, it involves um, uh, a supreme being operating through uh, these other creatures you could call them huh. extraterrestrials angels demigods spirits or whatever you want to call them uh, but uh, there is some process involved it's not an instantaneous uh, creation in the beginning. There was some kind of uh, descent with modification going on, some kind of, you could call it, di consciously directed uh, 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 genetic engineering of some kind, but it's, it's not the, the type uh, that the scientists are currently telling us about because that's a purely random, accidental process. Michael, then, who, who was Jesus? Oh, I think he would be uh, one of the, uh, if you look at what all cultures and traditions have said, uh, in this cosmic hierarchy you find a level of compassionate beings who come from time to time from their higher level, wherever it is, to come and uh, spread knowledge uh, about uh, uh, these higher things to the people on this planet. So he was some sort of angel? Um, 
convenient word, or would you yeah. use another? Yeah, a compassionate being, uh, the uh, Buddha, uh, the Christ. Uh, there have been, I mean, this is a very common theme in, mm. in practically every culture and uh, well, this, religion. Well, yes, uh, this compassionate being, right. angel, whatever. Uh, then what are all his teachings? How do you deal with those? How do you deal with the Bible? I'm going to ask you before my audience does. Oh, well, I think in the, in the Bible you definitely have the picture of this uh, cosmic hierarchy. You have uh, the supreme being on top. You have uh, various categories of angels. Uh, you look in the first uh, parts of Genesis, you have uh, apparently some descriptions of some extraterrestrial contacts with uh, Earth and even some, uh, some of these beings uh, mating with uh, terrestrial humans. You know, seeing the daughters of the earth as being fair and uh, having them as wives. Okay, so you find support for all of this then in the Bible? Oh, and not just in the Bible. As I said, if you look uh, through uh, the Jewish Kabbalah, you'll uh -huh. also find this cosmic hierarchy. You'll find it in the ancient Sanskrit writings of India. You, if you look at the Egyptians, the Aztecs, the American Indians, the Australian Aboriginals, uh, you will see basically the same pattern. Uh, and I think this is very significant, that all of these people in different times, in different places, talking about the same pattern, the same cosmic hierarchy, what that tends to suggest is that they are contemplating something real. Now, they may be contemplating it from slightly different perspectives, but they're looking at the same thing, it would appear to me. Well, how could they have uh, gotten it that wrong? I mean, Jesus um, viewed himself the Son of God. Oh, Son of God is that's uh, that's fine. Uh, that's fine. Yes, I think he would he would have said uh, we're all sons of God. Of course, he's a very special one, being uh, uh, given so much power to teach about these things on this planet. Hmm. Um, well, I'm sure there's uh, there are a lot of people who would sort of take you on. I mean, an awful lot of what's in the Bible is very specific and would would not uh, a at all jive with um, Michael Cremo, right? Oh, I'm sure there are those who are who who will want to take a, a view like that. I'm sure there are others who will be able to uh, appreciate the similarities uh, uh, between uh, what you might find uh, in one uh, book of knowledge and another. All right, Michael, do species come and go? In other words, uh, do we have species that, uh, in effect, exit the earth, as it is said dinosaurs have done? I think you argue with that, don't you? Uh, from what it appears uh, to us, if you look at... Uh, Various sources, be it physical evidence, uh, writings of uh, different ancient civilizations, it would appear that no species really goes extinct. It will always be existing somewhere, uh, somewhere, uh, either on this planet or perhaps some other uh, in some other part of the universe. Now, you did mention the dinosaurs, and it's quite interesting that. Although the standard scientific doctrine is that these creatures are extinct, there are people, even today, some very competent researchers who say they appear to still be living in some uh, parts of, of this planet. Where? For, for example, there have been uh, sightings of dinosaur-like creatures in Africa, in the Congo region. There's quite a quite a, a huge body of literature about that. Not very well known, uh, but uh, you have, uh, for example, um, uh, some French researchers have uh, published a, a very uh, uh, massive book about these sightings. All right. Uh, we're going to hold it right there, Michael. We're at the top of the hour, and we will soon, uh, soon get the uh, telephone lines open. And uh, I feel as though I ought to have a special dinosaur line, just in case anybody's got a line on a dinosaur out there. Fascinating. Uh, he suggests, indeed, they have been spotted possibly in the Congo. I had no idea. 
All right, we're going to break uh, here at the top of the hour, and we'll be back. Michael Cremo is my guest. His book, The Hidden History of the Human Race, and indeed it is very different than I have imagined. We'll be back with more. You're listening to the CBC Radio Network. Recorded for rebroadcast at this time. Please do not call. From the Kingdom of Nye, we continue with your calls on Dreamland with Art Bell. Call Art now, toll free at 1 800 618 8255. 1 800 618 TALK. First time callers, area code 702 727 1222. 702 again. I am here. And a very good evening to you all. This is Dreamland. My guest is Michael Cremo. Michael has an intriguing uh, uh, theory, uh, or actually, he feels it's a lot more than theory, and we're going to get to some of the evidence here shortly. He's written a book called The Hidden History of the Human Race. And apparently, uh, quite a hit it is. Some of the evidence coming up. Oh, and, uh, Michael, just before we get into the evidence aspect, I've got a couple of faxes here that I would like to uh, ask you about. One is uh, from a great faxer named Doc Berry down in Phoenix. And the question is, how does the immortal soul theory fit into the author's cosmic hierarchy theory? It fits in very well. Uh, that would be a big part of it. And I would say the physical evidence for that would come in the form of the medical reports, well-documented medical reports of the out-of-body experiences, the near-death experiences, and also uh, transmigration or reincarnation memories, such as those uh, studied by uh, Dr. Ian Stevenson, who is a psychiatrist at the University of Virginia. You know, he studied uh, thousands of cases of small children who uh, report uh, past life memories. Now, children, they can't go to the library and make up a very elaborate uh, past life story. These children tend to report very ordinary uh, past lives, and he's been able to document the previous incarnation of these children in hundreds of cases. I, I too, find children to be uh, very, very credible in these areas. All right, um, I'm, I hate to rush you, but we've got to do that. Okay. Here's another one. Is it possible that life has been brought to this planet numerous times, and like plant pot, we keep dying as a species? Our sponsors, the ETs, I guess, may not want to waste a perfectly good planet and have continued to recycle this place for millions of years. Good theory? Well, the part, uh, I don't know that I could agree with every detail of it, but the part, uh, the first part uh, that was mentioned, that uh, we've got multiple origins on this planet. Uh, we didn't come just once. It's an ongoing process. I, that is something that I uh, fully agree with, and I think the evidence supports it, especially if you look uh, down through history at what different peoples have uh, Reported, you get a lot of uh, evidence of different extraterrestrial contacts, different descents of uh, human species uh, on this planet, and I think uh, I think that's very well supported by the evidence. Uh -huh. um, and that's a good place to break into evidence. If I were to ask you, Michael, what is your best evidence? What is the evidence that supports your theory that man, along with other creatures on the planet, have been around so long? Give me the best stuff you've got. What would you give me? Right. Uh, and this is, and I think we really have to pay this attention to the evidence because if we're going to um, an alternative explanation to the evolutionary doctrine that is now so dominant, we have to show that that evidence, is not, that theory is not supported by the evidence. Otherwise, why even talk about these alternatives? So let's... Uh, Let's look at some discoveries that were made by some California gold miners back in the, in the gold rush days. They were digging tunnels thousands of feet into solid rock in the sides of mountains. Now, you know, I've 
talked with uh, geologists in the state of California, and they say that this rock in these mountains is at least 10 million and as much as 50 million years old. Now, inside these tunnels, these miners were finding uh, human skeletons. They were finding obsidian spear points. They were finding all kinds of human artifacts. These were collected together by a man named J.D. Whitney, who was the state geologist of California at the time, and he wrote a massive book about them, which was published by Harvard University in 1883. Now, my question is, why don't we hear about these anymore? Why aren't they on display in the museums? That's right. Uh, they were suppressed. The evidence was suppressed. There was a very powerful anthropologist uh, named William H. Holmes, in uh, Washington, D.C., at the Smithsonian Institution, that institution that's still there on the mall in Washington, D.C. And, and here's what... Uh, and, and I might add, Michael, uh, in the business, in my view, of distorting or, or trying to even recent history with respect to uh, World War II. But that's another story. All right. Uh, but, but you can see there's a whole history of how that distortion goes on. So this, this is what this uh, Dr. Holmes of the Smithsonian Institution said to uh, Whitney out in California. He said, he said that, and this, the exact quote's in our book, but this is a, a, a good, good rendition of it. He said, if, if Dr. Whitney had understood the theory of human evolution as we understand it today, then he would have hesitated to announce his conclusions, you know, despite the imposing array of facts with which he was confronted. In other words, the facts don't go along with the theory, then the facts have to go, and Dr. Whitney has to go, and the artifacts have to go. Uh, so, so there you had some very good evidence showing uh, you had human beings up to 50 million years ago in California. Uh, you know, going back a, a little bit further, uh, we had, uh, in 1862, uh, a scientific magazine called The Geologist that told how in Macoupin County, Illinois, which is right here in the United States, at uh, 90 feet deep below the ground in coal, uh, in a layer of coal that was below two solid feet of slate rock, an entire human skeleton, no different than ours, in other words, not an eight-man skeleton, but a, a skeleton no different than ours was found in the coal there. That, it just seems impossible that this could have happened, and I realize where you're going with uh, respect to then the age of that uh, uh, being, obviously, but it seems impossible to me that the traditional scientific community could either suppress, ignore, uh, or lie about evidence of this magnitude. Well, it does, it does happen, and it's still happening uh, today. Uh, we shouldn't be so surprised that uh, evidence can be kept uh, secret. For example, uh, we find that governments, uh, have, they can keep secrets. Uh, well, you know, I know that's true, Michael, but um, the origins of the, the human being, uh, it's such an important question that you would think that even scientists with egos regarding previously established theories would not be blind to really significant evidence like a skeleton in coal. No, no, now, how are they able to just dismiss, and how can they call themselves scientists if they do? Well, I just gave you the example of uh, this uh, William Holmes of the uh, Smithsonian Institution just saying, just bluntly dismissing uh, a huge body of evidence, human skeletons, tools, all kinds of things, you know, from, uh, from California, just because it went against the idea of human evolution. Well, he's but one now, scientist. You know, a, lot so. of, uh, a lot of power, a lot of prestige, a lot of money is involved in all this. There are uh, some of the big foundations, like the Rockefeller Foundation and the Carnegie uh, Institution, are involved in this. Uh, so you're saying... Gov well, governments are involved in this. We see that uh, <laughs> basically... Uh, this idea of Darwinian evolution is being enforced on the American education system by the full power of the United States government through its uh, judicial system. Uh, in other words, the scientists have got the United States government suppressing this evidence. Mm. Now, this is uh, and, and preventing it from being taught in, in the school. So, to me, it's not at all surprising uh, how, how, um, how a very 
powerful, elite group of people making use of every, every resource that they have can keep this evidence suppressed. And I could give you some very good examples of that that are going on even today. Well, still, it's incredible, Michael. When you... Of course it is. That's why, that's why I, I wrote this book. It is incredible. It is shocking, and I think people need to know about it. Um, but it is saying that all of these organizations and all of these scientists, instead of being devoted to a search for the, the truth, you're charging are devoted to uh, maintaining a cover-up. That's right. Uh, and this is going on in, in many areas. Um, well, I can tell you a person that I know personally who was uh, a victim of this kind of treatment. Um, it's Virginia Steen McIntyre, a geologist who was working with uh, the U.S. Geological Survey. Now, in, in the 1960s, some anthropologists went down to Mexico at a place called Huayatlaco, which is near Puebla, which is you know, just near Mexico City. Uh, and they uncovered some human artifacts there, some uh, advanced stone tools. And... When the anthropologists dig up something like that, they want to know how old it is. So what they do is they call in a geologist. Right. Because the geologist can tell them how old the strata of the earth were in which those things were found. So they called in Virginia Steen McIntyre of the U.S. Geological Survey. Yes. And uh, she and three of her colleagues uh, dated that site with four different methods and each of the methods gave an age of about 250,000 years which is unusual for two reasons first of all uh, no human being should have been in existence 250,000 years ago uh, anatomically modern human beings like us indeed and what to speak of in Mexico because the standard idea is that human beings didn't come over uh, to the New World until about 20,000 years ago when the Indians supposedly came over the Bering uh, uh, land bridge up in Alaska from Siberia and, and wandered down into America. Yes. So, so to have this evidence at 250,000 years in Mexico was shocking. Now, the anthropologists, they were shocked because it would ruin their careers. They, they were expecting, Indeed. oh, well, we'll get a dick. So Virginia Steen McIntyre, she decided she was going to stick with her dates. She, now, here's what happened to her. She couldn't get them published. Uh, she couldn't get the reports published. She was labeled a maverick and a publicity seeker in uh -huh. her profession. She, she lost the teaching position that she held at an American university. And finally, uh, she, she was forced out of her uh, job, and she couldn't work as an archaeologist, I mean, a geologist again. So what did she do? Change it all? What did she do? No, she still... Uh, she still she maintains. Still, she is still sticking by her guns, and uh, she and I were both actually on a show called Sightings uh, a couple of weeks ago. I know Sightings, of course. Right, and, and uh, she's trying to get that message out. Now, this... This is uh, one example of uh, some very direct uh, suppression that's going on. Hmm. In another field, this uh, Dr. John Mack, hmm. who's a psychiatrist at uh, Harvard. He, he's University. been a guest on the program. Right. Now, here's what's happened to him recently. We've received uh, uh, some communication from his, his attorneys who have told us that uh, he's he, of course, you know what he does. He, he, he has investigated uh, yes. reports of alien abductions uh, of people under hypnosis. And? And uh, Harvard University has convened a secret academic committee. Uh, and the report that this committee is delivering is, has said that he is uh, acting irresponsibly as a scholar. Really? And his attorneys say that this uh, report will be used to attempt to, to take away his tenure and perhaps even to uh, institute a, a, a malpractice suit against him. Oh, I'm so sorry to hear that. Now, now this is, uh, it's like the Galileo case all over again. Uh, so when we hear... Uh, that well, science is an objective process. I take it that he These will. The there, there will be. There is some procedure in place uh, to give Professor Mack an opportunity to defend 
the legitimacy of his views yeah. and research, correct? That's correct. And, and what and procedure is that? Um, uh, he has until, according to the communication that I saw, he has until March 15th to uh, offer a, a uh, defense. And I think uh, researchers around the country who are sympathetic to him are being asked to uh, write to the administration the, uh, of Harvard University in support of him. I'm so sorry to hear about that. Um, I'm so sorry to hear about that. I thought we had taken a step forward, and this uh, sounds like one, uh, maybe two, to the, the rear. Yes, uh, Art. And, and this is... Um, these are the things that convinced me that it isn't so hard to see uh, why evidence that goes against the standard views can, can be suppressed in other areas as well. It's a pretty good example, all right, and I'm sorry to hear it. All right, um, I would like to begin taking some calls, uh, if you would. Uh, boy, that's really shocking news about uh, Professor Mack. I, but when did you get that news? Uh, this arrived in the mail a couple of months ago uh, uh, here at our offices, and uh, it was uh, directed to my co-author, Richard Thompson, who is uh, the author of a book called Alien Identities, which uh, deals with uh, UFO questions. Mm -hmm. All right, let us begin taking a few calls, uh, Michael. Um, on west of the Rockies, you're on the air with Michael Cremo. Uh, good evening. Good evening, Art Bell. This is Ed. I'm in Ware Lodgeburg, California. Hello, Ed. A very good evening to you. I've uh, been very interested. I've been following your program off of other stations and it got shifted off of KSFO. I picked you up in my car. I don't have a phone there. I can't get it in my house, but that's where I'm calling you from. I understand. My friend, I have something that uh, perhaps you'll laugh. But about a year ago, I came across a series of books beginning in 1982, published by a credentialed person in Southern California who is a transcriber. The astounding thing about it is, and I'm, I'm shaken to even tell you this because I don't expect it to be believed, but there has been in print now since 1991 something called the New Revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is 760 odd pages in quotes. It's not a channel job. All right, can you give us a brief idea of what it is about? Yes, sir. It starts with the premise that uh, the spiritual progression uh, in the, what is known as the multiverse, universe, planet, earth, everywhere, is now such that a direct revelation uh, can be put into plain English instead of the language of correspondences that is used in the Bible because at that time humanity and much else was in its infancy and had to be told like don't touch this radiator it was or else and no explanations the astounding thing is that it sets forth in quotes as i say gotta hurry here yeah okay it sets forth the whole history of the human race of humanity in general its place the extent and degree to which our guesswork has been nothing much more than that and uh, it confirms that we are a splice job and probably ninth or tenth or fifteenth one down the line. All right. Uh, are, you, uh, are you aware of this, Michael? I've heard similar things. I'm not aware of that exact book, no. All right. Well, all I can say is you should, uh, sir, share the source with us. We're at the bottom of the hour. Uh, so please uh, feel free to share the source, fax or write to me. Let me know how to get hold of it, and we will do some investigation. That's all I can promise. Michael Cremo is my guest. The Hidden History of the Human Race, his book. We'll be right back. Now, Michael Cremo. Michael, uh, here is yet another fax. Your guest's theory on the origin of man is nearly identical to the descriptions by Randolph Winters in his book on the Pleiadians. That's from Richard uh, in, uh, I'm sorry, from John in Richland, Washington. Now, Michael, does that sound uh, familiar to you? Do you know about Randolph Winters? Uh, I'm not familiar with all the details of his, his idea. Um, what I will say is, uh, I think one of the characteristics of what I'm presenting is that it is not unique. Uh, you know, I, as I've said, uh, it's something that you will 
find mentioned in channeled communications. You will find it mentioned in uh, you know, this idea of the cosmic hierarchy uh, in, as I said, practically every uh, cultural and spiritual tradition that's ever existed. How much, uh, how much credibility do you give to channelers, uh, Michael? Well, it all depends. Practically every communication uh, that we have from higher dimensions, you could say, is in one way uh, or other channeled. Now, you may call it divine inspiration or the, the Holy Spirit speaking through someone, but um, I think channeling as a phenomenon, as a way of getting information from the higher levels in the hierarchy is a very well-established uh, fact. Now, now, what may be coming through those channels, I think we have to you know, judge, because sometimes you may be getting disinformation. I, I think this happens in many of the uh, uh, UFO communication uh, uh, well, it, happen, it happens in all related fields, I'm sure. Right. Michael, I'm sure. Uh, west of the Rockies, you're on the air with Michael Cremo. Good evening. Good evening. Um, I have just t I have two quick questions. All right, where, where are you? Uh, Tacoma, Washington. Tacoma, all right, go ahead. Okay. Um, earlier, uh, you guys said that uh, we've been, as humans, existing on the Earth uh, with all the creatures, including Bigfoot. Yes. And... Uh, I was wondering what he thinks of some of the stories that I've heard uh, about Bigfoot in connection with uh, UFO sightings. All right. Yes, well, I was alluding to that uh, before. I was saying that we can't consider these creatures simply to be uh, just sort of like big apes. They seem to have, uh, some of them, have powers that go beyond what normal animals would be expected to have and there is indeed quite a literature on reports of these creatures in connection well as long of, as we're as long as we're on the subject michael you keep taunting me with that powers they seem to have powers for example well it's very unusual that uh none of them have ever been captured uh, well, so you mean powers alive. powers of eluding uh, hunters right powers for uh, eluding hunters uh, also having been uh, cited in uh, connection with uh, these uh, UFO objects. Also, if you look at traditional accounts from the American Indians of these creatures, uh, they uh, tend to manifest some mystic powers, as do many of the other a animals uh, that may be uh, uh, mentioned. Okay, well, with respect to the UFOs, I guess it would make sense, Michael, that they would keep track of uh, one species, or Bigfoot, along with human beings who have been abducted and uh, animals uh, that we consistently hear uh, are abducted for one reason or another. So if your theory, if, if one accepts your theory, then it would make sense that uh, UFOs uh, would... Um, monitor these creatures as much as they might monitor us, only there would be far fewer of them. Uh, so I guess all that would uh, make some sense. East of the Rockies, you're on the air with Michael Cremo. Hi. Hello. Uh, this is Jack from Charleston, South Carolina. Hi, Jack. Hi. Um, I wanted to ask your uh, guest if he knows the air date of the sightings program that he said he uh, uh, taped a couple of weeks ago. That's a good question. And oh, that, also, that show, uh, I, I'm sorry, I... That show has already aired. It aired um, uh, this past uh, winter. I forget what day it aired. But oh, I it, usually it, check. It's already, it's already been on, on the air. All right, all right, I, will, been on. I, will, I will mention, however, that I'm now working on a, uh, as a consultant to, for one of the major networks for a, uh, a television special. I can't reveal too much about it, but uh, it'll be coming out in the fall. <laughs> all right. Uh, yeah, also, I want to ask quickly, um, I went to tell someone in my house... Uh, what you were already talking about, and it came back, you mentioned about something about too bad about Dr. Uh, Professor Mack. Is that that John Mack, the one who did alien investigations? Uh, right. Yeah, what yes, were you sir. saying about him? Uh, uh, well, okay. Um, I hate to have to go over it again, but basically uh, Harvard is um, uh, challenging Dr. Mack's uh, credentials and area of investigation, and uh, there's going to be some hearings or something. Is that is that about right, Michael? That's right. Yeah, he's 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 uh, the, the charge is that he's been acting irresponsibly 
as a scholar in in suggesting that uh, there may be actual some actual truth behind these stories of alien abductions. So there you are. Wildcard Line, you're on the air with Michael Cremo. Good evening. Hello, this is Fritz from Phoenix. Yes, Fritz. Well, over and over again, there's one mystery that baffles mankind for so many years, and I'm sure every one of you listening to these radio audience here is aware of it, that the Yeti or the abominable snowman, Sasquatch, or the Bigfoot definitely has a connection with the UFO. In my opinion, they're all under the umbrella of the extraterrestrial presence, and mm -hmm. they were brought here to our planet for whatever reasons. Michael, can you accept that? Well, that is uh, Michael's theory of uh, well, how we I got here. Well, I would say that we all have an extraterrestrial origin if we trace it back far enough. Uh, all of the creatures on this planet, and it, it may be uh, quite a complex series of events that led to all of the creatures on this planet being uh, placed here. I wonder why uh, the extraterrestrials decided to put so many varieties of uh, human beings here. Any thoughts on that? Well, it, it would appear that. Uh, there, now, from ancient Sanskrit writings, we learned that there are 400,000 human species scattered throughout the universe. Uh, so we may uh, be get, and, and it, it would appear also from the UFO literature that there are many types of um, uh, aliens. There are the, the standard grays, there are the uh, so-called Nordic type. Uh, it would appear there, there you also have a, a variety. So uh, it, it doesn't surprise me that uh, we may have been visited uh, many times and that uh, a human history may be much more complex than we've been led to imagine. Michael, when you stick with simple uh, archaeology, when you simply challenge traditional scientific um, theories regarding how long we've been here and how we developed, uh, it seems to me you're on one ground. That's when, right. Uh, when you jump uh, to an explanation that involves extraterrestrials, then you put yourself in exactly the same position as Dr. Mack is now in, uh, and it makes makes it much easier for the traditional scientific community uh, to throw fertilizer on your uh, whole theory. Yes? Well, they'll also try to uh, object to the uh, even the archaeological evidence, as you were suggesting earlier. Well, I know, but they hardly even have to bother with that, Michael, if, right. you know, given what you've given them. I mean, it, it, it makes it easy for them, doesn't it? Well, I think... There's another whole area of knowledge suppression going on, and that has to do with anything connected with uh, the paranormal or the extraterrestrial or that's the supernatural, true. Whatever, that's... whatever you want to call it. Well, that's what I'm saying. And, and uh, I think now what I want to do is directly confront uh, the scientific community on those points, and I don't think I'm alone in this. We're, we're seeing, for example, you have in existence today, an international society for the study of subtle energy medicine, which is composed of about 1,200 medical professionals and biologists that are looking at subtle healing and subtle energies. In other words, if we're going to have an alternative explanation of human origins, the first thing that we have to show is that there is more to the human essence that can be explained by chemistry, biochemistry. Indeed, it's a very good point. Yes, sure. And we ha you have the Institute for Noetic Sciences. You have many individual scholars who are courageously investigating these things. So uh, I see that there is, and it may sound like a cliche to say it, but there is a paradigm shift underway. And I think it's making a lot of progress. Well, I thought so, too, but hearing about Professor Mack makes me wonder. And uh, maybe you're underestimating the uh, resistance uh, that the traditional scientific community uh, will put up. It will be stiff, it will be strong, and it will virtually ridicule uh, people like yourself and, uh, and John Mack and others. Well, th these are the, the standard tactics. The first, the first line of defense is to try to ignore something. When you can no longer uh, try to ignore something, then you uh, ridicule it. Uh, that's right. And then, and then if that doesn't work, then you get the uh, heavier kinds of suppression. Um, but I think we have to 
look and see what would happen uh, in the case of uh, communism, for example. Right up to the last minute, they were in charge. Uh, yes. They were uh, still in charge, but uh, there was so much going on underground and around the sides that eventually the, the system collapsed, even though right up to the last minute... Uh, it, it, so you're, you're saying right. uh, tradi so traditional, science, traditional science will collapse the way communism did all at once, nearly with no warning, Boom, boom, the fences come down. Is that right? Because, because there are so many people who do not believe in it anymore. There are so many cracks in the consensus. There are so many independent scholars investigating these things and counter, uh, and as I said, so many organized attempts uh, by scholars uh, who, who are a little bit more independent to investigate these uh, subjects. So I think the combined weight of that will eventually bring about uh, a collapse of the current, Paradise. the current consensus. All right, which has uh, only been around for about two or three hundred years. I understand. All right, Michael, right. let's let's stay with the phones here. East of the Rockies, you're on the air with Michael Cremo. Hi. Hello. Hello. Where where are you, sir? Uh, Sarasota, Florida. Excellent. Go ahead. You're on the air. Okay. Uh, what uh, comes to my mind? I admit I missed about. Uh, half hour of your show here, but I'm thinking about uh, a photograph I saw that claims to be a sandal print with a crushed trilobite underneath, which predates most life forms on this planet by several million years. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, to that, recall, what, what you're talking about is the Meister footprint uh, discovered by uh, Robert Meister in Utah. Mm -hmm. And uh, my co-author, Richard Thompson, went and visited Mr. Meister. Um, he's no longer living, but at the time he was living. And we obtained uh, photographs, our own photographs of those footprints. Now, those footprints were discovered in Cambrian Shale in Utah. And uh, that rock in which those uh, uh, sandal prints were found is roughly uh, 600 million years old. And as, as uh, I've pointed out several times, according to what the scientific elite will tell us today, human beings like us have only been around on this planet about 100,000 years. As a matter of fact, 600, 000, 600 million years ago, they, they would say there was no life. Something was wearing shoes. <laughs> on, on, the, on, the, on the surface of the earth at all. Maybe there would have been some... Uh, uh, marine creatures, just life in the ocean. Uh, Michael, what those, about those what, prints what, are there? And we did a computer analysis of them. We uh, we found that the the shape of that uh, print did not deviate in the slightest from a modern human shoe print. Uh -huh. Michael, what about the possibility that that print was somehow somehow put in that older rock in more recent times? How do you discount that possibility? Well, from uh, the, the testimony of the person who discovered it, who said uh, he was a rock collector, and he was uh, going through an area with one of those little uh, geologist picks, or, yes. you know, and he was breaking open. He was looking for trilobites. So he was, which are those little fossils of these uh, little shellfish. Sure. And he was breaking open solid pieces of this rock. Mm. So it, it couldn't. It was not something that somebody could have carved into. I, I've got you. Into a rock like that. Okay, I've got you. Yeah. East of the Rockies, you're on the air with Michael Cremo. Hi, where are you calling from, please? This is Dave in Wichita. Hello, I, Dave. I wondered if Michael had heard about the age of the Sphinx being uh, at least ten thousand years old, and that some evidence in the Purnas, the ancient Indian writings, uh, say that it's about a hundred thousand years old. All right, the right. Sphinx. Dave, uh, I'm very familiar with that. You're talking about the work of uh, Dr. Robert Schock, who is a geologist at uh, Boston University. He analyzed the Sphinx, the weathering uh, of the Sphinx, and uh, determined that it was far older, many thousands of years older than uh, current Egyptologists would say. And he was, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you about how this uh, knowledge suppression uh, factor operates. He wants to go back and conduct further, uh, further uh, studies, but 
the uh, Antiquities Department, you know, the, the government of uh, Egypt, uh, the, the, the uh, department in charge of that, that uh, those uh, monuments will not let him go back right at the present moment. Now, uh, the Egyptians themselves, if you look at the ancient Egyptian writings themselves, they have a list of pharaohs going back 400,000 years. The Babylonians also have king lists going back 400,000 years. Uh, so this is... The, most people are not aware of these facts. Uh, you, you read in your standard textbooks about Egyptian history, it only goes back a few thousand years. Huh. All right. Uh, first time caller line, you're on the air with Michael Cremo. Good evening. Hello. Uh, is, is, are we on the air right now? Yes, we're on the air, sir. Oh. Uh, yeah, I didn't mean to uh, get on the air. I just wanted to find out... Um, All right, if you don't want to be on the air, I'm going to have to go to the next call. I just wanted to find out what time Dreamland is on. Uh, it's on right now. Yeah, but uh, through the week. A Dreamland is not on during the week. Is it only weekends? Yes, that's correct. What time? 7 to 10. Uh, Saturday and Sunday. 7 to 10 Pacific Time, uh, Sunday. And not on Saturday? No. Okay. All right, thank you. Um, east of the Rockies, you're on the air with Michael Cremo. Hi. Yeah, good evening, Art. Uh, my name's Ed from Albuquerque. Yes, sir. Uh, I have a question to ask him. I, I, he's familiar with Scientific American Publication, isn't he? Yes, I am. Yeah. Uh, about four years ago, there was an article that was written uh, about the genetic study that uh, was trying to correlate uh, orangutans back to humans, and the study uh, concluded that this wasn't uh, feasible, but the genetic study put man... All the way back uh, 150,000 to 200,000 years ago, and the origin took place uh, somewhere near Egypt. And uh, this was a very, very precise scientific study. And when they were ready, ready to release their findings, uh, they found out that Japan had done exactly almost an identical, similar study. And uh, the data, uh, you know, was very, very comparable to one to the other. And it stated that they didn't know how man started, and they were kind of te tongue in cheek by calling it uh, Eve uh, as, as a starting of origin of man, 150 to 200,000 years ago. And this was done in a very, very scientific genetic basis. Uh, could you answer on that, please? Well, it's uh, very interesting. What happened was is that a couple of years later, uh, that African Eve hypothesis was shot down because uh, other scientists came and proved that the statistics uh, that were used in, in those reports uh, just did not work. All right, on that note, we've got a break right here. Uh, it is the top of the hour. Relax for a few moments, Michael, and we'll come back to you. Michael Cremo is my guest. His book, The Hidden History of the Human Race, and there's a lot. We'll be back. This is CBC. Hot talk. This hour of Art Bell was recorded for rebroadcast at this time. Please do not call. The Kingdom of Nye. We continue with your calls on Dreamland with Art Bell. Call Art now, toll free at 1 800 618 8255. 1 800 618 TALK. First time callers, area code 702 727 1222. 702 727 1222. Or the wildcard line at area code 702 727 1295. 727 1295 in the 702 area code. Now again, here's Art Bell. The listeners to my regular weeknight program no doubt will appreciate this. Art, after listening to you and your guest and giving, uh, given our warlike uh, disposition not to get along with each other, could Earth be your Dahmer Island? Fred Kogo. Yeah, sure it could, Fred. Dahmer Island is uh, sort of an invention of mine, a place where criminals would be taken. Obviously, his theory that, uh, <laughs> that all of Earth uh, is some sort of Dahmer Island, that we are prisoners from some other place or time. One never knows. Uh, let me begin this hour. Uh, we're going to take care of our commercial content here. Uh, the Sea Crane Company sell... Now, Art, could you ask your guest 
if he's heard about the rock that was found in Death Valley by some rock hounds that when cut in half contained a ceramic diode. The rock was dated somewhere around 500,000 years ago. Michael? I've heard about it. I haven't been able to get any very detailed information about that. The clear implication of that would be either alien technology or technology once before developed by man, uh, long forgotten, and uh, now, of course, full circle. But it would suggest one of those two. Well, I think you're absolutely right there, and uh, the, the whole idea of cyclical time, things coming and going, is uh, an idea that I'm very much in favor of. Actually, if you look at uh, Aristotle, back at the time of the Greeks, he had the same idea. He said the great inventions of human civilization have been made time and time and time again in the course yes. of cyclical time. Yes, you don't find that to be in competition with your... Um Hypothesis. Not at all. As a matter of fact, it tends to match up with it. Uh, uh, what we find, if you look at the entire history of archaeology and anthropology, is that you've got a very bewildering mixture of advanced artifacts and simple things, uh, human bones and ape man like bones, all mixed up going back hundreds of millions of years. And this is really what you would predict if there were a kind of cyclical pattern uh, to this whole process that we're involved in. All right, back to the phones. Uh, on the wild card line, you're on the air with Michael Cremo. Hi. Yes, sir. Uh, from the Tri-Cities. Tri-Cities, Washington, yes. Yes. Uh, there's an anagram for, uh, for some of these uh, different, uh, for these artifacts. Artifacts out of time or something like that. I've read several books about this. Uh, Oh, the gold chain found with uh, two lumps of coal at either end. And uh, the, like an art school in France where you could see where somebody had corrected, made correction lines and stuff. And there were normal people wearing trousers and shirts with buttons and stuff like that. I was wondering if he had heard about any of this. Uh, yes, I have. Uh, of course, that anagram you're talking about is Oop Arts, Out of Place Artifacts. And uh, the uh, gold chain, uh, I've got a case of that in in the book, The Hidden History of the Human Race. Michael, and, how do they generally dismiss uh, what you're calling Oop's Art? How do they dismiss it? As, as how do they dismiss yes. Out of Place Artifacts? Yeah, that's right. I mean, do they call it fantasy uh, of people at the time uh, or what? Well, in many cases, this has been so effectively suppressed that they hardly even know about it. Um, if um, uh, Usually, uh, they will try to say it's a hoax, it's intrusive somehow or other, it's slipped down from some uh, higher level down to some lower level, which is why in our book, uh, Hidden History of the Human Race, we tend to concentrate on cases that are very well documented and where all these possible counter explanations are dealt with. All right, look, it really sounds like it's worth a read and you haven't done it, so I will ask you to do it. Plug your book. How do people get a copy of The Hidden History of the Human Race? Well, it's available in bookstores, and if it's not in a bookstore, we have an 800 number, 1-800-443-3361. Uh, they, you can call during business hours during the week and order the book that way. Let me give the number again. One eight hundred. How much is the book? Uh, Twenty-two ninety-five. And it's a hardback. Very nice book. I've got it here. One eight hundred four four three 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 six one. And increasingly, it sounds like it's uh, well worth the read. I'd like to say I've read it already, Michael, but I, I will now dive into it. You've intrigued me. On the uh, wild card line, you're on the air with Michael Cremo. Hi. Uh, hi there. Uh, Mr. Mr. Cremo, you mentioned uh, 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 technology, or we were talking about technology just a couple minutes ago. Uh, do you have any uh, detailed information or any kind of information about what different kinds of technologies were used by man in his more advanced stage as he was planted on the planet? From the reports that you get from many ancient writings, 
it would appear they had some very advanced technology. Right. Uh, from the ancient Sanskrit writings of India, you find uh, what are co called vimanas or spaceships of mm -hmm. various kinds. Right. Um, we've actually got reports in, uh, you know, from coal mines of uh, polished stone walls being found in coal mines two miles deep underneath the ground. So from varieties of sources, whether we're talking about archaeology or uh, ancient writings, it would appear that civilizations in the very, very distant past may have had uh, technologies superior to those of today even. Okay, and, and those technologies, would, would you know if they were more uh, tied in with the, the natural forces of the earth rather than an artificial type of technology? All right, um, that's good. In other words, uh, were they in tune with the planet in some way that we were not or uh, presently are not, uh, Michael? Yeah, so even if you go back a little bit in uh, recorded history to the times of the, the Greeks and the Romans and uh personalities like that, you'll find that uh, many times they got their technologies from higher beings. They didn't build factories on this planet to build them, but they would communicate with higher beings and uh, uh, receive uh, technologies, more advanced technologies from them. Uh, so that kind of technology exchange has a long history on our planet and may still be going on today for all we know. A uh, faxed question for you, Michael. Do you think there's any indication that these extraterrestrial intelligences have guided or interfered with human history? Uh, are you familiar with a book called The Gods of Eden by William Bramley? Um, that is a very common hypothesis. I think you'll also find it in uh, Zachariah Sitchin and others. Yes. Um, where I might disagree with some of these accounts is that it's uh, been going on uh, much longer than they would uh, suppose. And in many cases, they tend to accept the standard idea of human evolution as it's printed in the textbooks and then say at some fairly recent point in time you have some alien intervention that resulted in uh, our human species as we know it today with our advanced civilization. Could you give me a couple of examples of where you think they may have uh, uh, interfered in effect with human history? Oh, if you look at uh, the whole history of uh, the, the, the human race, you'll see many accounts of uh, divine interventions, practically the, the origin of every uh, religion on this planet is attributed to some kind of uh, intervention from some extraterrestrial source. All right, well then, here's a hell of a question for you, uh, Michael. Okay. If, uh, if everything went to hell in a handbasket in Russia, which frankly is very unstable right now, with, as you know, at least 30,000 deliverable nuclear uh, weapons, and somebody over there went out of their mind and did the unthinkable and launched their weapons against us. Uh, if there would ever be a moment for intervention, that would be it. Would you think the launch and the war would be successful, in other words, in ending the human race, or would there be intervention? It's a very good question, Art. Yes. And I think this is, this is something that comes up all of the time. I think there's something uh, uh, pretty much of a cosmic paranoia when uh, we're confronted either with the type of event that uh, you've described or uh, the fears of what uh, different kinds of alien beings might do. Michael, any... And, and any, any, this, any what I would say, this is where the cosmic hierarchy comes into being. Right, well, let me, let me add to it, uh, Michael. Any right. species-threatening event, uh, let's say that uh, Ebola Zaire uh, became airborne and it threatened to end the species, same question, would there be uh, intervention prior to a species-threatening event? In the case of any particular event, I couldn't say, but in... In general, in the ultimate sense, uh, the forces in the cosmic hierarchy are at the top good. They're well-wishers to us. And in the end, in the final analysis, uh, the powers of 
good that are watching over this whole hierarchy yes. will prevail. And I think even now they are limiting the influence of uh, uh, elements in the hierarchy that may not be so benign. And I think this is something uh, we can all take comfort in. All right. Uh, wild Card Line, you're on the air with Michael Cremo. Hi. Hello, Art Bell. This is uh, Roy from Everett, Washington. Yes, sir. I'd like to ask Michael if he's if he's seen any evidence of Atlanteans in his work. Ah, Atlantis. Yes, Michael. Uh, your view on that? Yes, of course. Atlantis is familiar to us from the ancient Greek writings as a sunken landmass that was much uh, that was previously inhabited by uh, a race of uh, people who had some advanced civilization. In the ancient Sanskrit writings with which I'm familiar, there are also descriptions of uh, sunken land masses that were uh, previously inhabited. I think uh, there's been some uh, very good uh, underwater archaeology done in the area of uh, Bimini and uh, uh, the Bahamas, and where there do appear to be uh, stone uh, structures in deep, found deep in the ocean. Uh, so, yes, I would be prepared to find evidence for sunken land masses that were once inhabited. All right. Uh, east of the Rockies, your turn with Michael Cremo. Good evening. Hi, Art. Hi. Where are you, sir? I'm in Oshkosh, Wisconsin. Oshkosh. All right. Uh, welcome to the show. My name's Renzo. Yes. How are you doing? Fine. Well, Michael, I was wondering. Well, actually, I, I think that... People feel that Bigfoot is connected to aliens because he's so hard to find. All right. I was talking about that a little bit earlier. That's exactly what I suggested. Yes, and, well, I would give you uh, my theory that if the UFOs or the, the extraterrestrials, uh, Michael, are keeping track of all of us, they've got plenty of opportunity to do that with human beings, with cattle, uh, with many of the things we hear about being abducted, but perhaps few opportunities to interface with Bigfoot because there are, um, I think arguably, very few Bigfoot creatures. So obviously uh, anything connected to a UFO and a, and a Bigfoot uh, uh, would be not a great surprise. Uh, there would be very few of them they could monitor. Wouldn't that be true? They appear to be rare, although you do get sightings around the world in varieties of locations and even on the east coast of the United States. Not well, I'm, I'm sure you do, but I mean, how many, of, how, many, how many have you seen? I have not seen any myself. Same deal with me. So at least they've got to be fairly rare. Right. Uh -huh. All right. Uh, wild Card Line, you're on the air with Michael Cremo. Hi. Yeah, I'm calling from Kogo. Uh, yes, sir. And, uh, okay, Mr. Cremo. Yes. From what I understand, okay, you're saying that uh, all right, uh, extraterrestrials have been coming down and affecting the evolution of man or actually uh, creating man. Very, very good question. It's a, it's a, it's a, as I was suggesting towards the beginning of the show, I think we are part of a cosmic hierarchy of beings, originally spiritual originally spiritual, and uh, we've come down from an original position, original higher dimensional spiritual position, and we've been placed in a position in this hierarchy. And the way that we've gotten here is that we've been given bodies by beings higher up in the hierarchy by a process of reproduction. Uh, in other words, these beings higher up in the hierarchy from uh, descriptions you find in various ancient writings and also from uh, evidence that we can see today have uh, bodies made of more subtle elements than we do. All right, I'm trying so to listen. by a process but, of reproduction. Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to listen very, very carefully to what you're saying here, Michael. Are you saying that we were created by those beings um, in most senses? Well, our bodies have been, in other words, there's a process of reproduction that's going on. If I could say one thing, the, so the problem I have, uh, okay, we have vestigial uh, parts in our body, like a tailbone, an appendix, I mean, useless stuff to us as homo sapiens. And another thing, too, if man's been around this long, uh, 
You know, why isn't there a fossil record of actual bodies back, you know, 500 million years ago? Well, but ago? there is, uh, oh, yeah. uh, according to Michael Cremo, right, Michael? Oh, that's, uh, you know, we were talking about that uh, human skeleton found in, in the coal mine in Macoupin County, Illinois. We got in touch with the uh, Illinois Geological Survey, and we asked them, well, how old is the coal in that mine? And it's over, you know, it's 300 million years old. Uh, so we do have, uh, you know, skeletons going back that far. And as far as these uh, similarities with other creatures, uh, 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 that might just be a, a good design process where you start with a template and then you simply modify it to uh, uh, get different creatures rather than building each one up from scratch. I think that's a very common thing in engineering and hmm. software, computer software. You don't try to invent the wheel every time, but you start with some template or model and uh, vary it slightly. So you might expect to find, uh, if, if uh, you do have, uh, say, as the ancient Sanskrit writings say, 400,000 types of human beings. So we, uh, we would simply then, in essence, be the Rembrandt uh, work of some um, greater intelligence, some uh, extraterrestrial intelligence. We would have been the final grand work to date of that intelligence, correct? Uh, that that may be giving uh, uh, too much credit. I'd say the higher... The okay, higher Michael, I, I'm sorry. We're at a break point. We'll, okay. be, we'll be right back. This is CBC. <laughs> This hour of Art Bell was recorded for rebroadcast at this time. Please do not call. Well, on May 13th, we're going on vacation. Huh. Going to Hong Kong, uh, China. Into uh, Red China, if you'd like to come along on that side trip. Then uh, Bangkok, and then back home. The whole thing will last about eight days. Uh, unfortunately, it is now on a space available basis which means you call the number I give you if there is any space left or if they can find any or if they have a cancellation they will get you in it's the name of the game it's getting late so if you would like to come along I'll be there my wife will be there Bob and Sue Crane will be there a lot of people are going to be there if you'd like to come along call 1-800-633-2732 that number is good at Oh, I think about 8 o'clock in the morning, Pacific Coast time. 1-800-633-2732. My guest is Michael Cremo. His book and his theory, The Hidden History of the Human Race, actually, he represents it really as more than that because he says he has evidence. Evidence of a man being far, far older than uh, anybody else can guess. And we'll get uh, uh, millions of years, uh, or even hundreds of millions of years, or even billions of years, and we'll get back to them in just a moment. The human race has been around for over several um, million or billion years. Would it be out of the realm of possibility that we achieved advanced space travel before? And if so, why would we not leave the planet in time of disaster and later return to rebuild and bring that same technology? Therefore, we should be more advanced. Roger, uh, in Sparks, Nevada. He's saying, uh, why haven't we been back? In other words, if there was an earlier civilization that achieved space travel and went somewhere else, why have we not been back? Uh, well, I'd say to Roger, this has to do with the whole idea of cyclical time. As a matter of fact, from what we can see, and this, this appears to be even true uh, geologically speaking, is that the Earth has, has in fact been through a series of uh, devastations. Uh, we, we find this mentioned uh, in many ancient writings, including the ancient Sanskrit writings of India, there are periodic de devastations where uh, advanced civilizations are wiped out. And then after that, uh, there has to be a process, uh, again, an extraterrestrial process of bringing uh, the humans and civilizations back to this planet again. 
Uh, and it just may be that right at the moment we're in a, in a downswing in uh, one of these uh, vast cosmic time cycles uh, where uh, the level of civilization tends to be going down rather than up. Well, uh, let me sort of back that up, uh, Michael. I do a daily talk show that deals with events going on on a daily basis, politics, human behavior, and all the rest of it. And uh, many times I have observed, and I, see, I feel many times, uh, now, I realize my observation uh, span is very short. We are all mortal, and we don't have a lot of time to look at the bigger picture. But a lot of times, Michael, it seems as though our social behavior is deteriorating, as though socially we are devolving, not evolving. Would you comment? Uh, according to the ancient Sanskrit writings, we are in what is called the Kali Yuga, uh, which is in the... In the cycle of time, a period in which human behavior is predicted to devolve. Devolve. So I wouldn't be surprised, and I, I've noticed some of the same things that you have in, in terms of these social trends over even short periods of time. Well, I'm not sure uh, that we have a long enough span uh, to really make a you know, a valid observation, it's kind of shooting from the hip, but it does look that way at times, uh, Michael, as though we are devolving. West of the Rockies, you're on the air with Michael Cremo. Hi. Hi, this is uh, Steve from Seattle. Yes, Steve. And uh, I was just wondering if the human race was supposed to be around for millions of years, that uh, wouldn't we be more advanced now than we are? Uh, it's, a, it's a very good point. And, Michael, to add to what he just said, why has most of the technological development some come so quickly uh, here in the last 50 years, let's say? Okay, so, Steve, uh, I think we have uh, become conditioned to what I would call the linear progressive time sense. Yes, of course. Where uh, we think that everything goes from uh, the simple... Uh, to the more complex without a, a break. In other words, if it was older, it must be simpler, and if it's more, if it's newer, it's more advanced, and in the future, things are going to become more and more advanced. This idea of cyclical time uh, that I was talking about may be a more accurate reflection of what happens in, over the long term in human history. And as I was suggesting just a moment ago, we may be in a little bit of a, uh, of a downswing right at the moment. Now, as far as what you were mentioning, Art... Well, about, well socially, about, uh, Michael, it seems like socially we may be in a downswing, but technologically we, we appear to be uh, chugging right along, and that's a fairly recent development. The last 50 years technologically it's really uh, taken off. Well, one way to look at this is that... Previously, a lot of the things that we do now with machines were previously done directly uh, by people. In other words, uh, they had the ability to see things at a distance. Now, some people appear to have that even today as a, one of the extrasensory you know, powers. Uh, now, we may be duplicating that uh, now that people are no longer... Uh, able to exercise these powers uh, through their uh, physical organisms, we may be trying to duplicate them through technology. Uh, and that may not be an improvement. <laughs> um, it seems as though the powers we have, for example, to um, uh, well, precognition uh, is a good example. I've had one example of it myself, Michael, uh, uh, an experience of precognition. I definitely knew an event was coming. There's no question about it. Only one in my whole life. I've talked to other people who have had uh, similar events. Is this a talent once held, now only uh, occasionally to rise uh, to the surface, or is it a talent we are now developing uh, for the future? It appears to be, if you look at the uh, broad sweep of human history, even as it's recorded in, in our history books, that these powers were apparently much more common in previous ages. And if you look towards the beings that are 
uh, a little bit higher up in the higher cosmic hierarchy in human beings. They seem to have these powers to uh, a degree that we can only imagine. So it would uh, appear that now we are in a in a condition where uh, these powers, which are natural on a, on one level, have become uh, weakened. But they could be developed again. Okay, uh, wild card line. You're on the air with Michael Cremo. Good evening. Hello. Hello. This is, this is Roy and Everett. Everett Washington. Hi, Roy. That's right. I'd like to ask Michael Cremo if he's if he believes that um, the mammals of the sea were brought from outer space. All right. All right. Uh, the mammals of the sea. Roy, I think all the living things on this planet have an extraterrestrial origin ultimately and this is this is an idea that uh, well the ancient Greeks had as well uh, for example you had Plato talking about uh, forms ideal forms of all creatures originally existing on some higher dimension and they're projected somehow down to this dimension and given uh, physical form. Let me throw so, a little. So I think I think I think we've got to look uh, off of this planet for the origin of all uh, the species. Whether we're talking about the mammals in the uh, oceans or the ones walking around on on the land, and uh, I think there are all kinds of extraterrestrial contacts that have taken place. Okay, let, let me years. throw a little. Let me throw a little monkey wrench maybe in all of this. Okay, Michael, uh, how would you account for new species? Not only do some species, according to scientists, become extinct, but there are new species that appear on the planet. Now, are these carried down by uh, our extraterrestrial friends or? Are they just a product of nature and and the evolution of, of uh, uh, mammals and uh, um, all matter on this earth? Um, in other words, how did these new species get here? On the wider cosmic scale, from the information that I've gathered from various sources, including uh, the ancient uh, writings of various countries, including uh, the Sanskrit writings of India, is that there is a fixed number of species numbering in the millions on the universal level, and these may be uh, imported uh, to the earth that we know uh, on different time scales. Uh, in other words, somewhere, somewhere, all of the species are always existing, uh, but at any particular time and place, only some of them may be visible to us. And through what means do they arrive here? Um, by uh, sometimes by extraterrestrial means, sometimes by you might call it intradimensional means. Um, it gets you to a whole area. We may not even be able to penetrate all the regions of of this Earth. Uh, that that is uh, uh, something that we've heard down through history. For example, the Hopi Indians say that they come up from four different levels below the earth. In other words, there's some subterranean uh, regions there that normally uh, human beings and animals can't penetrate. So, so there may be um, uh, dimensions even to this earth that we're not yeah. able to uh, penetrate, and perhaps uh, some of these creatures enter and uh, leave the world of our experience from uh, these nearby uh, regions. Dimensional portals. Right. Mm -hmm. All right, East of the Rockies, you're on the air with Michael Cremo. Hello. Hi, my name is Nick. Yes, Nick. Rockton, Illinois. Yes, Nick. Well, Michael, I, I tend to disagree with you. I think it's obvious that evolution happened by itself. Um, look at dogs and cats and, and what's a hyena? You know what I'm saying? There's there's no animal, there's no plant. I, I would say that plants and animals evolved from one being that I would call God. And well, our, I love we might not have a disagreement if we if we uh see what what the process is. Um uh if you're talking about um uh because I, I would agree with you that there's God at the top of the hierarchy, and uh, there's a process of um, of uh, descent with modification uh, by which 
from one generation to another, all the creatures uh, that we're familiar with this, uh, familiar with on this earth, including ourselves, have been produced. Now, but that's not the kind of evolution that you'll find described in uh, the Bible, in the in, in the text, the, Bible. Books, the Darwinian textbooks, mm. or oh, Darwinian or the Bible. So it well, argues it argues with both, and and well, I take it, caller, you're uncomfortable with that. Well, I, I'm looking at the sex contract right now by Helen E. Fisher. Have you read that? I haven't. If you could tell me about it, I'd be, like to hear it. Well, it's very informative. I like it a lot. Um. It's it's kind of, kind of feminist view of how evolution went, but it's really it's about sex um, as as it went and how we evolved. But um, it basically what I think is that if you look at chimpanzees and gorillas and orangutans and the re regions they were they are today, you would see that the orangutans are near Asians. And the chimpanzees tend to be more like white people, and gorillas more like black people. And if you look at, say, Asians today, and Indians, American Indians, and then look at Eskimos. Well, I've, I've at, never heard it quite suggested that way. That's very interesting. Uh, wh how would you respond to that, uh, uh, Michael? That there appears to be that connection to uh, uh, some of the major um, uh, racial uh, variations on the earth today. Well, first of all, uh, I don't accept that we have come from monkeys or orangutans or, uh, you know, gorillas. The, the, the fossil evidence, you know, the actual physical evidence that we document in our book, The Hidden History of the Human Race, shows that simply we've coexisted with these creatures for millions and millions of years. There's no uh, physical evidence at all that we've evolved from them. So right from the start, I would have to uh, respectfully disagree with the hypothesis being presented. I am curious, uh, Michael, see if you can answer this straight out. Okay. Um, do you find more uh, fanatical resistance uh, to your uh, hypothetical, uh, or I guess you could even suggest um, the evidence of the evolution of the human uh, being, do you find... Uh, more exception to it from the scientific or religious community? You know, it's, it's very interesting that uh, I've been finding that I've been able to go uh, all over the world, and I have been. I've been able to uh, make these presentations to... I've been on uh, Christian radio shows and television radio shows, and I find they're very receptive to the fact that I disagree with Darwinian evolution. Okay, the question again, from which camp do you think you find more stringent uh, objection, scientific or religious? The most, the most objection I have been finding is from those who are in the mainstream scientific establishment. That is where the most opposition that I have encountered has been coming from. I would imagine that would be true because uh, at least your theories uh, involve a concept of creation that the religious folks might be able to be more comfortable with yeah. than the scientific people. I see. All right. Uh, first time caller line. You're on the air with Michael Cremo. Hi. Hi. This is uh, Joe up in Reno. Hi, Joe. And uh, it's a pleasure to call you, Art. I listen in every now and then whenever I can. And, Thank uh, you. I have a thought on this. The uh, you know we're electrochemical devices. We're perfect androids, biochemical computers. If you really look at us in a big picture, sure. And uh, the electro being the spirit, the android, the movement, the device that moves around is the chemical. Uh, who knows where it goes in stores? Maybe in the ozone layer or whatever. But you could see how things could be uh, spirits could be implanted or beings could uh, come into us through something like that. It's a very uh, tangible and logical uh, way, and I wondered if, if Mr. Cremo had had any uh, experience in dealing with uh, with it in that logic. All right, it well, may be the last answer we have time for. Go ahead, Michael. Yes, uh, Joe, I think you, you, know, you mentioned uh, something that's very important. Uh, it seems like if we want a good metaphor for the entire universe and our place in it, it may be like a virtual reality system on a computer. Huh. Now, if you know how those operate, that means you take somebody who's outside the computer and you hook up different devices to their senses, like mm -hmm. you put 
little, uh, uh, what they call iPhones over their eyes, small right. video monitors. That's right. Uh, so that they, uh, it creates uh, the sense of being involved in the computer world even though they're outside of it. So uh, in one sense, you could say that the person is being implanted into the virtual reality system inside the computer. So I think uh, you're mentioning soul, and I think what we uh, really are is we are souls who have been implanted by uh, some system into the, uh, a virtual reality. All right, that is where we're going to have to end it, Michael. Very quickly, because we're out of time, where can they get your book? The book is available by an 800 number, 1-800-443-3361. It's also available at Barnes & Noble and other book chains. Please All right. It. Michael, it has been an absolute pleasure having you on the program. Art, it's been a pleasure for me as well. Hope we get to talk again sometime. Thank you, my friend. That's Michael Cremo and his version of the hidden history of the human race. To get a copy of this program, call 1-800-917-4278. That's 1-800-917-4278. Thank you all, and we'll see you again next Sunday at 7 Pacific Time. From the high desert, good night, everybody. This has been Dreamland, a program dedicated to an examination of areas in the human experience not easily nor neatly put in a box. Things seen at the edge of vision, awakening a part of the mind as yet not mapped. Yet things every bit as real as the air we breathe but don't see. Please join us again next week at this time for Dreamland.